Welcome back everybody, this is Eric and Chad here. Yes, we're at Moss Pawn and Gun hanging out. Finally had a chance to come back and do some more videos. I know it's been a while since we've been here at the shop, uh, but we always relish the opportunity to get up here and do some videos for you guys. About a year ago, roughly, we did a video called the 762 Confusion, where we talked about um, you know, all of the confusion that surrounds 308. When someone says a 308, 762, like, discussing 762 mm -hmm. as a bullet diameter. Well, we're going to kind of break apart the same exact concept, except this video is going to be called the 22 confusion. And, uh, and there, there is some confusing things out there about uh, 22, not only 22 rimfire ammunition, but also centerfire. So we're just going to have some fun and break down some of the uh, you know basic concepts that we're talking about here and, and just try to have some fun with this concept. 22 is <laughs> yeah. it's an interesting uh, interesting topic to say the least. Yeah, it is. It is. So what we'll what we'll start by saying is that rimfire ammunition in a 22 uh, category comes in uh, in a few different varieties. Actually, several different varieties. Uh, rimfire 22 ammunition is probably one of the most varied cartridges there is in terms of loads that are out there and everything like that. There's even a guy that's making a reloading kit where you can actually reload your own 22 ammunition. From but, once fired cases. Once fired cases. So, but here's one of the weird things about 22 long rifle ammunition that people don't really seem to realize is that it is a conical healed bullet. Mm -hmm. Okay, which means that a healed bullet. If I take these uh, these calipers right here, with a healed bullet, if you notice the diameter of a 22 long rifle case is the same as the bullet as it's crimped right there. Okay, so it's one continuous measurement throughout uh, the entire. Uh, cartridge itself. If I pull this projectile, it's got a little heel, and that heel is what that, that cartridge crimps into to really make that strong crimp that you're getting there. And the diameter on this, this happens to be a 22 short. The diameter on this 22 short, right at that point, is 223, which is a nominal bore diameter for most 22. One of the interesting things about the 22 uh, cartridge itself, you know, given that the casing is the same diameter as the projectile itself, is that they make swaging dies where you can take once fired 22 long rifle cases and make 5.56 five, jackets with them, or 223 yep. jackets. Some people have actually had some pretty good luck with that, uh, with the whole concept of swaging. Yeah. Uh, they might take a really good piece of match grade uh, 22 brass, they go out and shot 500 rounds, pick up all their match grade 22 brass, sort it, and then swage it into 5.56 five, jackets, and then you're living to shoot another day, and you're keeping the cost of your shooting down a good bit. So that was a 22 short. Uh, we actually jumped ahead in line a little bit though, because originally, before the 22 short, uh, came into a, a you know really good predominance. Uh, you had what were called flowberts. Mm -hmm. Now a flowbert diameter wise is a little bit skinnier than a 22. It's not a true 22, um, but we thought that the flowbert would be important to showcase in this video because uh, you know back in the day they used to have literally like shooting galleries inside of bars and places. So you could get together with your buddies on a Sunday, go to the bar, get sloppy face drunk, and shoot flowberts inside the bar and they would have little shooting ranges and those guns became known as Flobert rifles. So mm -hmm. a lot of uh, gunsmiths in Belgium and Germany and all over uh, the Europe and everything used to make little Floberts and they were basically just kind of like a like a, a little breech, uh, falling breech style single shot rifle and they were meant to be fired at very short intermediate ranges. Yeah, I mean, the same thing with 22 short, when 22 short kind of came into the picture, you know, it was used a lot in like shooting galleries at carnivals and fairs and things yep. like that. I mean, that was commonplace back in the day to have real guns at these events like like that. Absolutely. Yeah. So part of the 22 confusion, so you had Flowberts, then you got 22 short coming mm -hmm. onto the scene, then you long. had 22 long, 22 long rifle, then there's um, uh, 22 Winchester Rimfire, <laughs> which is actually not a 22 Magnum like people think that it it's is. It's kind of intermediate. It's intermediate, so. and then you have 22 Magnum. So the family of Rimfire cartridges that are 22 bore is confusing just right in its own regard before you even start talking about center fire cartridges. There's an odd one too on that we don't have on the table. I actually just thought about is the um, Aguila sniper subsonic ammunition because it's a heavy uh, 22 pill, you know, heeled projectile, but it's loaded into a 22 short case. So you get the same length as a 22 long rifle, so mm -hmm. it'll operate in those style of actions, but it's a heavier projectile, which you know, I've done a little bit of playing around with it, and it's quiet. 
it's very quiet, quiet. And th there's also some things that there's some confusion about the 60 grain Aguila Sniper Subsonic that's been put out there. You know, some people are like, hey, you got to use a fast twist barrel. You got to have mm. a barrel of a certain length. And that certainly is the case. So we've done some testing where I should I say <laughs> we like I have a frog in my pocket. Actually, Chad has done some testing. I've, with shot it. Him, I've shot it out of a couple of different platforms. I mean, pistols and rifles. And it, it just will not stabilize out of like a 1022. It won't stabilize out of my CZ 455. But it seems to stabilize out of the pistols just fine, especially yep. in my little stumpy Ruger. Pretty Oddly random. enough, I mean, I, I don't get it. But random, hey, very know? random. But that is an interesting case in that it's kind of a marriage of the long rifle and the short into one package. Yeah. You know? So. Well, the you know to add to the confusion, okay, there's a lot of cases <laughs> where a larger parent case. Let, let's say that, for instance, I have a shotgun chambered in three and a half inch magnum. Mm -hmm. Okay, say that I take a three and a half inch magnum chamber and I put a three inch shell in it. Mm -hmm. I can shoot that three inch shell. Say that I put a two and, two and three quarter, quarter inch. I can shoot a two and three quarter inch through it. I can shoot a, an Aguila mini shell, mm -hmm. which is an awesome shell to shoot, and it's no problem. But with a 22, you don't get that backwards compatibility like it went from Magnum to all the other standard chamber pressures. The chamber dimensions for 22 Magnum are physically different than 22 long rifle. Mm. If I put a 22 long rifle in a 22 Magnum chamber, it's gonna blow it out. It's just not gonna work, yeah. okay? The case dimension of a 22 Magnum is larger because the projectile is actually not a healed style. So the case diameter on that is a little bit larger than on a 22. It's like what? 27? You got about you got about six thou on either side. Okay. So that's just enough for these little skinny guys to uh, to to have so about a failure. Two, 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 seven, two, two, eight. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're around two two eight on that. Uh, now with twenty two long rifle, you're actually in a position where you can shoot mm. all of the above through it. So if I have a, a firearm that's chambered in twenty two long rifle, I can shoot shorts, I can shoot uh, longs, I can shoot uh, CB caps, calibres, which is another. Uh, variety. This you, is a 20 grain Calibri. Yeah, you can't shoot it out of every platform. Like semi-automatics, yeah. you know, they won't run them and everything, but like old gallery guns, like yeah. uh, the old Winchester 64s, yep. uh, most oh, bolt actions. Like a actions. Winchester or a uh, Remington 512. Oh god, yeah. Those I mean, will feed anything you want. And like I've got an old uh, Mossberg uh, M24, I believe. It's an old like target style 22 and it's got mm -hmm. an insert in the magazine that you actually unscrew and you can run long rifle. You put the insert back in, you can run shorts. You know, one of the most interesting guns out there, in my opinion, and one that I've always been a humongous fan of, I love the Marlin Model 25 oh God, because yeah. that magazine, no matter what you stuff in it, it'll feed it. I can take 22 shorts and I can put it in the same magazine and it'll feed just like it's made for it. I can do it with longs, long rifles, sniper subsonics, calibres, shot. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the round oh, yeah. that I'm holding is a calibre and this is a 20 grain. It's basically nothing more than a healed pellet that's 20 grains and it uses just the uh, primer and maybe a very small amount of powder, I believe. But One, one of them, you know. I think, just uses the primer, the Super Calibri. One of the two uses a little bit of powder. I think the Super has a, a tiny amount of powder, and then the, the standard one's just the primer. Yeah, and I've seen these come in where people will try to shoot them out of a rifle, and they've literally stacked them in their bore, and they've got, you know, 20 yeah. or 30 Calibri projectiles just stuck yeah. in their bore. <laughs> well, they don't really develop the kind of pressures that, that can harm anybody, but no. still, be careful with them. Treat them like real ammo. They are not, you do not want to shoot each other with they them or anything are, like that. They are great for backyard plinking, though, especially sure if they have a leave your revolver. barrel. You know, before oh, you yeah. shoot a whole bunch of them, make sure they're leaving your barrel. <laughs> All right, so then, last but not least, then you have, like, 22 long <laughs> rifle shot. This is a shot shell, and that's something that's marketed for, like, pest control. Mm -hmm. You can shoot little rabbits or snakes. I think you probably just piss most snakes great off. Great out of a little revolver like uh, mm -hmm. Smith & Wesson 60 or something Absolutely. Like that. So, all right, moving past 22 long rifle, I think we can all safely say we understand at this point what we're talking about. When someone thinks of 22, that's primarily what they think. And even within that, that small realm, there's a lot of confusion there. But let's talk about like the first kind of super powered 22 round, which would pretty much, uh, from my knowledge, be uh, the Winchester 20... service rifle, well, which yeah. eventually became what we know as 5.56. Five, well, I don't know. You know earlier, there, was, there was probably some earlier ones. Earlier for than sure. that, I mean, you got like tw 220 Swift. I mean, that came out in like the you 30s. You know what's funny? We're actually referencing a Cartridges of the World here. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Ray. Yeah. And in Cartridges of the World, there's actually a Savage Model 1899 cartridge here that is a 22 bore, and it's under the Wildcat category. We like Wildcats. We like Wildcats. So looking through the Wildcats, we've got a Savage 99, which you know is a model 1899, that's chambered in a cartridge called 22 Cheetah. 
So there's a lot of oddballs and wildcats out there that used a 22 diameter bore and that experimented yeah. uh, with a center fire cartridge. But I think that most people, when they think of a center fire 22 cartridge, what do most people automatically go right to? They think 223. Two, two, three. And, and that's where this adventure is going to kind of lead us in this video. And we're also going to talk about 545 by 39, mm -hmm. which really, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But we do have a few varieties of 223 ammo right here. Uh, this is actually a military tracer round. Um, so you can see that you've got a brass case with a neck, bottleneck. So it's a bottleneck cartridge. Um, it's got reasonable case capacity. It's a center fire cartridge, so it can be reloaded quite easily. And you've got anywhere nominally from around a 55 to 62 grain uh, projectile is kind of the norm for military 5.56 five, ammunition. You got ammunition. up to, you know, 77 grain for like, you know, specialized military operations such as that. Uh, sure. You know, hollow point boat tails. I mean, even like 80 and 90 grain projectiles for like mm -hmm. competition use that you have to single load in like an AR platform. One of the biggest confusions though is between 2.223 and 5.56. Absolutely. So, you know, 2.223 basically is the commercialized version of the military cartridge and it uses a faster or a uh, little bit slower twist oh yeah you know, so like Usually. a one in 12 and the throat depth is a little bit shallower than on a 556 five, because of the increased chamber pressures with this round plus you get faster twists you know anywhere between like one and seven one and eight one and nine to stabilize these bigger projectiles correct so. and and also there there's there's another kind of thing about it too is that the way that 556 five, brass is physically drawn mm -hmm is thicker drawn than 223 Remington. Remington, 223 Remington brass is always gonna be a little bit on the thinner side, mm -hmm. so you're gonna get actually more case capacity out of a commercial case than you will out of a military case, which it may not really matter to some people, like if you're just gonna go <coughs> shoot your gun or whatever, it's no big deal, but say you're gonna reload, all right? So say you, you use a bunch of 223 brass you found and you develop this really cool load and it shoots good and everything like that, and say that it's on a little bit higher on the charge spectrum yep. in terms of powder and say that oh well I ran out of this brass or I lost it all now I'm gonna buy a bunch of uh, you know Radway Green or SS109 brass or uh, you know, basically a bunch of NATO spec brass that's military brass and I want to take my pet load from my 223 and put it in that brass well you're actually gonna get per powder charge higher chamber pressures out of a 556 five, brass than you will 223 two, because mm -hmm. the thicker walls you get less case capacity the lower the internal volume of the case case to case the higher the pressure for a given powder charge is going to be yep i mean so if for you, reloading you want to keep that in mind yeah like you said if you're on the top end and you switch brass to a military spec brass uh, I'd, I'd, you know. I'd, I'd go back 15 percent and work your way back up if not more yeah i mean so there, there's definitely that confusion between 223 and 556 five, both very very similar cartridges both of them very very similar chamber dimensions like he mentioned a little bit longer throat on the 556 mm -hmm. five, then there's some kind of the intermediate chamberings that we won't really talk about like the wild chamberings and then some of the match grade all of these chamberings basically have varying uh, degrees of how how little the chamber walls will actually allow the brass to expand and that's where you get run into reliability issues in a combat firearm if the 556 chamber was needed because they wanted reliable extraction ejection reliable feeding and sometimes under very very adverse conditions and especially for like machine guns and such the chamber is a little bit more generous but when you got like 556 five, match chambers it's got the long throat but a tighter chamber wall and then wild is one of those chamberings that can accommodate both 223 and 556 five, yeah. very readily and, and so. accurately you know oh, reasonably accurately. accurately and that, yeah, that's the a big chamber, thing title the chamber better accuracy so. exactly so there's a lot of little spin-offs from 556 that we have now that are much more modern cartridges I mean a lot of people don't realize that 57 by 28 uses the same projectile now granted lighter than mm -hmm. a, you know you can't run like 62 grain 57 that I know of you might no, but, but nominally your your cartridge is going to be like 40 grain well I know a lot of guys that actually but it's the same diameter they, they take Hornady VMAX projectiles mm -hmm. 224 Hornady VMAX projectiles and they load this ammo and uh, you know it's, it's pretty interesting I mean that and that's pretty neat cartridge as well because it was designed around you know submachine gun but also a handgun so yeah and we talked about that in our perfect pairs video absolutely so. I'm a big fan of 57 by 28 uh, one of these days I might go the Elmer Keith route and I might blow up a 5.7 trying to experiment with the craziest <laughs> long projectiles I possibly can. That's probably a, another story for another day. But again, when it comes to the 22 confusion, 
the 5.7 by 28 is at its heart a 22, mm -hmm. literally. On it steroids. is a 22 as, as things go. Now, there's a lot of videos out there that might compare 5.7 by 28 to 22 Magnum. Mm -hmm. So see, there's where you're drawing a few parallels between the 22 uh, confusion uh, as well. Yeah, but as far as like power factor goes, I mean, they're very similar, but you know, reliability wise and firearms that are chambered in that particular caliber, you know, it's, it's a little bit, uh, just not a whole lot of them out there. All right, but and then blanks. Blanks, okay, those are so, interesting. So th this is, you know, basically just a 5.56 five, blank. So earlier, like we showed you, the 22 long rifle blanks, you can also get 22 Magnum blanks, and then you can get the 223 5.56. Five, this is actually a military M200, which is a 5.56 five, blank. Speaking of like military cartridges, what were those, um, weren't there some like 22 accelerator cartridges that were like basically 30 out six cases or 308 cases that were neck down yes. to 22? Well, they weren't neck down. They were actually oh, Sabo. Oh, they were Sabo. They that's were right. Sabo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's an excellent point. Uh, you do have cartridges that are an accelerator variety. So there was actually a line of, of ammo from, what was it? Was it Remington? or I can't remember. but you It could... might have been Federal. I don't remember which company, but at one point they used to make an accelerator round and you basically had a 30 alt 6 with a Sabo that was a 30 cal, but then inside of it was like a, you know, 55 grain hollow point or whatever. <laughs> right. And you get that thing moving out of there at butt naked speeds. Ray said those projectiles are running like 4,000 feet per second, yeah. which some of the commercial cartridges we have down here get up to those kind of velocities, yep. like like 22250, which we'll probably yep. talk about in a bit. But yeah, we don't have any 22250 I mean, here to show you guys. But <laughs> I forgot all about those, man. That's just crazy. So one of the interesting things about the 22 confusion is there's any number of other center fire cartridges out there that use what we basically call a 22 caliber projectile. If I go over there to the reloading wall and I grab a sampling of different projectiles, there's a strong chance I can take a 40 grain VMAX projectile, I can load it in 223, I can load it in 22 Savage if I want, I can load it in 5.7, five, 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 mm -hmm. I can load it in 22 250, mm -hmm. whatever you want. I can't load it in 22 long rifle because 22 long rifle, you buy it and there it is. Now granted, there are some provisions for reloading your own 22 ammunition. All of those provisions, in my opinion, are extremely far-fetched and uh, I myself would not really care I, much for that. I talked that. with a fellow recently who actually bought that kit and he said it's extremely time consuming and very frustrating to actually try to load it, but in a situation where you may have to reload it, then it'd probably be worthwhile. But just for everyday use, yeah, not so, so much. So how about a uh, newer cartridge that's also a 22? How about, yeah, how about yeah, this yeah. little guy, the 22 TCM. So there's a pistol on the market that's, uh, it's like a 1911 style. Is it a arms core or is it rock Ar arms core? Arms core, okay. Yep. So it's nine millimeter, but it comes with a conversion barrel for 22 TCM, which is basically a nine millimeter case neck down to 22. And it's supposed to have, you know, similar performance to like 5.7, that sort of thing, in a little bit less expensive handgun and caliber conversions. So I think Arms cool Corps loves the ammo, and I think Rock Island makes the gun, if I'm that, not mistaken. That might be the case, yeah. but I shot one of these recently, um, I think at the NFA Review Channel shoot, and I have to say, it's pretty dang cool. Very soft shooting and really accurate. I mean, those bullets are getting down. Oh, yeah, you know? that's neat. But 22 well, TCM. There's one that, that I always like to point out to people. Many people don't know what the 220 uh, PPC is. Mm. Okay, 220 PPC... You know what it is, you just probably never thought about it. It's 545 by 39. It's basically when you when you have 556 and 223, 220 PPC before 545 rifles were really predominant in this country, it was known as 220 PPC and it was basically a kind of a high velocity sort of bench rest cartridge, right? But we know it as 545 by 39 these days and well, There's really not a lot of provisions for loading your own 5.45 ammo. No, I've seen people or you know heard people talk about taking like 220 Swift Brass or whatever and cutting it down. I think, yeah. but I mean I've never tried reloading it before. We've just bought it. But this is interesting because this is the only projectile on the table that is a true 22. It's a 220. It's 220. So, so it's a little tinier. It's a little slimmer uh, than your standard 5.56. Now. There's probably some arguments out there that could be made mm -hmm. to the effect that, I don't know, you know how it is when it comes to com block weaponry. Maybe they didn't want the enemy to be able to like use capture components or captured ammo. There's no telling what it is. But I will say something about rifle accuracy, okay? Mm -hmm. And we're, we're going to talk briefly about things that make up rifle accuracy. And 
545 by 39 as a cartridge is a very accurate cartridge. This is a 7N6. It weighs 53 grains. It has a long bearing surface. It has a destabilizing pocket in the nose of the projectile. When this projectile hits soft tissue, it causes a tremendous amount of yawing, causes the bullet to tumble, and just really, in general, just mess things up bad going in. This is a bullet that used to be called the poison bullet in Afghanistan. When the Russians were in Afghanistan, all of the Mujahideen that were shot with the 545 experienced some really nasty wounds and this got to be known as the poison bullet. One of the cool For things that about that, like Eric mentioned, the long bearing surface, you think about the comparison between like 308, like a 308 bore, yeah. and 65. You know, 65 is a smaller projectile, but it's a longer projectile as well. More bearing surface, more uh, inherent stable, uh, stabilization, mm -hmm. higher ballistic coefficients. Same idea with this. I mean, we shot these guns a lot, and they are just insanely accurate, especially over like the 7.62 counterpart. They are. So. They are. It's a vast improvement in the AK platform. Is the 545 cartridge Great. slimming down the cartridge? And uh, one of the interesting things that can be noted there. We'll talk a little bit about rifle accuracy in general when it comes to. 22 bore guns, okay? They went with a 53 grain bullet, so it's a little bit lighter bullet, but because of the slimmer bore diameter, to get that 53 grains, they had to make the bullet longer. Mm -hmm. So that gives the bullet a nice long bearing surface. It gives it a good ballistic coefficient, so you get good downrange performance in terms of drop and everything, so it's a very flat shooting cartridge. It's very soft recoiling because it's only 53 grains and the charge is pretty reasonable. Also, when it comes to accuracy, you get, um, in, in the gun world, what we, I guess what Wildcat guys would call a square charge. Mm -hmm. You look at the charge and it, it's a very uniform charge when it sits in the case. Mm -hmm. The shoulder angle is very, very uh, kind of gradual and tapered and it gives very good velocities for uh, the size. All of those things equate to a very accurate rifle. If you take a, an AK, and you put a little 22 bore in it instead of a 308. Well, now the walls of that barrel are thicker, and they're, it's going to have better uh, barrel harmonics. You're going to get less barrel flop. You're going to get better accuracy overall. And that is the name of accuracy when it comes to rifles. You either have to do one of two things. You either have to make all right. So say you've got a big old eight millimeter or th or a 30 cal bore and you want to make that bullet longer so it has a really good ballistic coefficient and it flies straighter and truer for longer and has um, just a better ballistic coefficient. The only way to do that is to go longer. You can't go fatter, you have to go longer. So that means you also have to go heavier. So then you start running into problems with, you're, you're kind of taking one step forward and two steps backwards. What a small bore, like a 6.5, 6 millimeter, 5.56, 5 22, what that gives you then in that, that case is you get that skinny bore, so the only way to make the bullet uh, heavier is to make it longer. And by making it longer, it's still staying skinny, so you get excellent ballistic coefficients out of a 22 bore, a 6 millimeter bore, uh, a 6.5. You start getting into the 7s, the 8s, and the 30 cals, then you kind of, oh yeah, you know, then you got to have a whole bunch of powder to get that heavier bullet out there and get it really going in. That's the best explanation I would have for that. Sounds good to me. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna steal this book from Ray. That's fine, that's um, fine. Getting onto like sporting cartridges. Sure. So like 220 Swift, you know, this was a caliber that came around uh, back in, there it is, back in like the 30s. Yep. You know, and you're getting butt stomping velocities out of this thing, anywhere between like 3,700 feet per second, and, like 4,000 feet per second back then. You yep. know, that's not a new thing. 22, 250, you know, that's not, a, that's not a new thing. Those kind of ballistics aren't. You know, and it's then, random to think about, isn't it? I mean, you know, when, when you look at a small bore, high velocity cartridge, a lot of people think, oh, it's just going to zip through something that's not going to do a ton of damage. So when it comes to rifle cartridges, you, you have to start thinking along the lines of, okay, do I want something that's small and fast and a good ballistic coefficient? And granted, I can hit what I'm aiming at, or do I want to go with slow and heavy and it's just going to crush the crap out of whatever it hits? But we might be lacking the distance, yeah. the accuracy. So it's it, it's it always a, a, a fine dance there it between is, the two. It, it's it's prevalent to have different firearms for different purposes. I mean, like a, a 22 caliber bore. I mean, these are commonly you know used for like varmint hunting, uh, small predators, things like that. I mean, sure, deer and medium sized game can be hunted with it. Military I mean, uses 5.56 five, you know, five, still. You but, know? Oh yeah, of course. But like a, a small fast bullet traveling. 3,600 to 4,000 feet per second. I mean, it's getting to point A to point B 
with <laughs> with a ton of of speed and it's flat as as a laser. I mean, just about. I mean, you could probably shoot 300 yards. I mean, like this. Uh, Ray was talking about the 225 Winchester here. This is a kind of old obsolete cartridge that was designed in like the mid 60s. It's a rimmed case, and uh, you know you've you've heard of 3030 seven millimeter waters or 730 waters. Sure. Um, yeah, 225 Winchester. Absolutely. I mean, it's kind of neat. It's pretty random when you think about, you know, all of the stuff. I mean, small bore is definitely not new. It's been around a long time. But I tell you what, from a military perspective, um, the people that really, in my opinion, made the most out of small bore were the Swedish military with the oh, 6.5 yeah. by 55 is, in my opinion, one of the best military cartridges, if not the best cartridge for just general purpose use there is. But our government, the U.S. government, we were on the big the the small bore route way sooner than that a lot of people don't remember the six millimeter lee navy and it was a gun that wasn't really successful they weren't produced in quite as large in numbers and for some reason it didn't really catch on but ballistically the six millimeter lee navy mm -hmm was technically one of the first small bore military cartridges not only for the u.s government but really at the time it was a very very kind of far-reaching and modern cartridge for a military rifle what six millimeter that's tiny that's not going to hurt anybody but it was fast it was accurate the recoil impulse was gentle it had good ballistic coefficients it could reach out and really do great things but the six millimeter Lee Navy just didn't catch on. And then the US military never saw another small bore cartridge as a military cartridge again until the 556 came along. And then, as they say, you know, the rest is kind of history there. Pretty much is. I mean, there's a lot of spin also the 556 as well using the same parent case. I mean, oh, that yeah. could be a, a totally different video in itself, yeah. you know. But here you go. This is kind of interesting. So, uh, 224 Weatherby Magnum. It's a belted 224. That's something you don't see every day. I mean, Weatherby. The whole thing about a belted case, and, and it, I think that more or less it's also been deemed to be kind of unimportant now mm -hmm. versus what it was when originally belted cases came out. Not only was it kind of partial to proper head spacing, but also pressures. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of the pressures are actually against the bolt face. Uh, when, a, when a bolt closes on a cartridge, well, the chambers of the, the, the rifle, that the chamber itself contains a lot of the pressure, but a lot of that pressure is also exerted rearward into the bolt face, and I guess their thinking was a belted cartridge having a little bit more meat back there would allow for those forces to not have as an adverse effect on, I guess, wear and tear on the gun, not to mention the case blowing out. Mm -hmm from the additional pressure. No doubt. One interesting note, I remember Ray uh, talking a little while back about the 22 Newton. You know, this is a cartridge that was developed, and we don't have one here obviously, but it was a cartridge that was developed in 1912, and you're talking an original loading of 90 grain projectile driven at 3,100 feet per second. I mean, in 1912, that was unheard of. Yeah, I mean, but, that's... but the thing is, they had the right idea all the way back in mm -hmm. 1912, and mind you that that's pre-World War One. Oh yeah. So, I mean, we could have had a, a you know, what, what if they would have chambered, a, you know, a number one Mark III infield or a P-17 or a P-14 or something? What if they would have chambered one of those in a <laughs> yeah, 22 and Newton, you know, running around with some lasers? Yeah, and all these that folks <laughs> that say that a 22 caliber isn't really a good big game cartridge, the 22 Newton or the 22 Newton was soon displaced by the 256 Newton, which had superior potential as a big game cartridge. So basically they just necked it up a little bit and then, I mean, it's a 25 bore, but yep. still based off that same parent case. Absolutely. You know, back, back in those days, I mean, it's just crazy. Well, back then, I think people also had a very, very big emphasis on shot placement. Oh, yeah. Something that a lot of hunters these days don't understand. A lot of them do. A lot of guys understand shot placement. You can use a much smaller cartridge if your shot placement is impeccable. And we actually, to segue into this, oh, we yeah. actually learned that recently on a, on a hog hunt where we got to use the 25-45 sharps. So this is taking all the things we just talked about. Now we take the same 223 parent case and we neck it up to 25. And we're getting, remember what we talked about earlier with a uh, long bearing surface, you know, a little bit better ballistic coefficient. Mm -hmm. So we're not having to make the bullet longer so it won't fit the action. We're actually keeping the bullet the same uh, length overall, but we're seating it a little deeper and then we're getting more uh, weight because the bullet is physically larger because it's 25. One of the interesting things, like uh, we, we had a long discussion with uh, Jay Lesser, the owner of Sharps Rifle Company, about the 25-45 uh, and uh, we were watching videos of him take down Buffalo with this round. 
you know? Five. So um, what's interesting about it is the powder that they use, they actually get a complete burn in a 20 inch barrel um, and down to the shorter barrels as well. I mean, the powder burns completely, so suppressors stay nice and clean. You don't get a lot of over um, or un underused powder, you know, burning off before, you know, the projectile can get up to full velocity. So, I mean, some of these rounds are getting 3,000 feet per second. Absolutely. You know, and that's like a 70 to an 87 grain pill. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's butt stomping, and that's a lot of power in a small package it in is. a 223 parent case. And an auto loading AR, which and is awesome. And an AR, too. yep. So, you know, hopefully this video was well received. Hopefully you, you know, learned something from this particular video. This is certainly not all of them. There's way more than what we covered here. Believe me, this is just scratching the surface of what the 22 Confusion can really kind of fully encompass. Uh, we hope that you learned something. Maybe you'll consider uh, picking you up a copy of like Cartridges of the World or some of the other volumes uh, very much like this. There's a ton of stuff, not only on the internet, but YouTube and stuff that's been put out on the you know, publication route uh, that can definitely point you in the right direction if you want to learn about every little thing that's out there. Reading but material this, for days. Exactly. But this video was mainly intended to cover the most commonly uh, confused cartridges in the 22 variety and I think we we covered that fairly well. I think if I had to say what causes the most confusion is just 22 rim fire. Yeah. You know, short, long rifle, long, I mean extra long, and there's so many different variations and people are always asking questions about chamberings and such. I Oh yeah. And so. then like lead versus plated, yep. subsonic versus supersonic. There's oh, a yeah. lot of confusion out there. But guys, you know, you'll find that just a quick Google search and a little bit of searching around, mm -hmm. you can find a lot of great information out there that'll uh, yield you the results you want and that'll point you in the right direction. So hopefully this video helped educate you a bit. We greatly appreciate the support. Uh, we've been getting a ton of emails from you guys with all different kinds of ideas and we try to get to every single one that we can. Uh, we appreciate the support. We have many more videos like this on the way. Thank you for watching. Take it easy. Oh, you. <laughs>